Hello, good evening, and welcome to the TNT Show. I'm John Drummond, and I'm your host for the next 60 minutes. Thanks to you, the TNT Show and Indie Live are growing and delivering more exciting shows than ever before. If you want to know what those are, go to indielive.net for more details, and please put some money in the crowdfunder. You'll see all the details on the screen. Well, it's been another great day for British democracy. The Tories are arguing that ethics is very important, uh, but now is not the time. Thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, tonight we are talking to William Thompson, and with the emphasis on what currency and independent Scotland ought to have, plus local council elections, plus how do Scots get to know about what's happening in economics, what's important to them, how do they evaluate, these are big, big subjects. So we've got all that to talk about tonight, plus the local council elections, there's so much more. Now, William is here for a full hour, and he's taking your questions live. And there's still time to get your questions considered. Again, you'll find all the details online. TNT, of course, stands for The Nation Talks. So in many respects, this is your show. We're live and we're free. So no license, no problem. Now, to our guest tonight, The Nation Talks, William Thompson. Thanks for joining us, Willie. William, how are you? Yeah, I'm very well. I'm very well, thank you. Nice to see you, John. Um, I'm coming I'm coming from Barcelona, of course. Yeah. <laughs> sunny so, climbs. Sunny so, climbs. It's worst thing at the start, yeah. Well, it's been a horrible wet day today. My family have gone to London and it's much nicer there than it is here, which happens sometimes. Which happens, yes. The important thing is that you're here and you're able to join us and you're able to talk about economics. Uh, I think it will be helpful if we, if we can start with... Uh, a short video which describes some of the conversations that you've had with leading economists across the world in which you've asked them questions about how do you think Scotland ought to uh, uh, organise itself in the event of independence and in terms of the economy and the currency and all of that good stuff. So can we take a quick look at that and we'll get into perhaps some questions in a second. Sure. Yeah, so, so this is just a little kind of guide of the journey that we've been on in the nine months to the conversation that we've had um, with, uh, with economists. So um, just a few minutes, I hope you enjoy it. I mean, that's what's driving my whole interest, really, or, or the fact that I can't leave it behind, because I keep trying to leave economics behind, but I just think it's such a powerful language and it does literally drive policy. Can you give us a definition of what inflation actually mm -hmm. is? Yes, I can, which would have made for a very short interview if I'd opened with no. Okay. These idiots, I mean, these overstretched idiots believe they can apply their model to areas that they have no knowledge about whatsoever, which is climatology. But the reality is that growth has had its chance and it hasn't delivered for enough people. It's not as if when Scotland's economy was growing prior to COVID that that, that lifted, enabled enough people to come out of poverty, that it delivered quality jobs for people, that it helped communities feel in control of their lives. As far as the UK government is concerned, no, it has never um, repaid, not since the 18th century anyway, the whole of the UK's national debt. Currency issuers, in their own currency, don't, in a meaningful sense, have debt at all. There's no other developed country, sophisticated economy, has ever tried to use somebody else's currency. The Eurozone isn't a case of using somebody else's currency because it's a, it's a currency union with a shared currency, and that's completely different. Um, to the extent that an independent Scotland would have its own currency, um, that would be a positive, right? The status of, of Scotland right now is the equivalent of a, a district or a municipality transitioning to an independent Scotland without acquiring full monetary sovereignty and the capacity to issue a national currency is not true economic independence. You're still, from a financial economic standpoint, you're still going to be a sub-region of the UK uh, government. The, Scotland wouldn't have any influence over the Bank of England. Whereas if we were uh, part of the European Union, we would be one of the members who had, you know, even if it's kind of tacit influence, but we would effectively be giving our monetary policy to a foreign country. I see. Uh, well. Mm. So by having your own currency, you have the ability to educate your children such that they can be successful wherever they may want to go. And at the same time, have an economy that's vibrant enough 
attractive enough the full employment economy where they if they want to stay home they can stay home and that you would be attractive to you know people you know globally people would want to move to Scotland because of your economy so you can only do that with you know independent Scotland with your own currency you cannot do that as a province of the UK a brilliant, brilliant question I mean, that's a really profound question. Apart, it's, a, it's a really, really interesting question. Um, yeah, it's a very good question. Good question. Uh, that's a very, very, it's a very good question. Um, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, I mean, that's such a beautiful and very hypothetical question. Um, so, you know, I do, I, I do think that all of these small things together will create a big thing. And That was great. I enjoyed that. And we should we should underscore the point here that uh, the show that follows this TNT show is Scottonomics, which is your podcast. So, yeah, so I'll have a busy evening. <laughs> <laughs> and we have to finish on time tonight, John. We've got to finish we, on time tonight. We, we have, have to make we have to make sure we do that uh, <laughs> because it's later it's later for you than most of the people watching. So you're you're an hour ahead, as it were. It seems to me that your thinking is also some distance ahead as well. Uh, tell us how you got interested in economics. Why did you decide that an economics podcast was necessary? Well, I studied economics at university and um, I studied it for a year. And then in the, uh, I remember at the end of that first year handing in a paper um, and I wanted to look at economics and how it could solve some of the problems I was studying um, in Dundee and we had a huge drug problem and I had a paper about the price, it was about price elasticity and I was saying that it doesn't really matter what you put the price of drugs up to, people will still uh, will still use them. So this was an example of the difficulty looking at a product just by price and you have to other things you have to do to affect it and um, I remember my lecturer saying, no, this is not the type of topic we want to discuss. You know, this is too abstract. I can remember thinking this is exactly the type of topic that not only I want to discuss, but I think economics should be discussing. So I kind of thought, I don't know if this is the right topic for me. Maybe it's politics. And I went off and studied that instead. And I also remember how difficult the mathematics was. And I got I got, I got the feeling that mathematics was, was introduced into economics to chase people away from it. And again, I was talking about these real issues and someone said, well, can you explain that in a quadratic formula? And I was saying, no, of course I can. But I can tell you that there's, drug, there's problems with drugs in Dundee and I want to be able to solve it. And economics should have been able to do that and should be able to do that, but it wasn't. So that was my kind of initial um, feeling and flavour of economics and why I kind of got rid of it. I was always really interested in it. Um, and I know it's such an important area for people to understand. And when... A couple of years ago, I was starting to look at economics again, and I was really excited by this movement called Modern Monetary Theory, which was looking at economics from a different lens. And I thought, I think now's the time to get back into this and try and use it again to explain how we can structure an economy that works and how we can use those tools that economics allows us to look at to to benefit a society so that's why i came back in and obviously we looked at this specifically through the idea of scotland becoming independent and that's really where we were having all of our conversations with the 30 odd um, economists that we've spoken to which, which was about how can scotland what is scotland's economy like how will it cope um, what will it look like if it's an if, if it uses its own money if it uses someone else's money so really that was how i got back into this i really feel that it's not okay for politicians to be agnostic about the money that's used in an independent Scotland. And this, and, and, and to directly answer your question, John, I wanted to come on tonight because your interview with Alan Smith uh, and Alan Smith said on the currency, I'll try and do my Alan Smith voice on the currency. I'm kind of agnostic. And I thought, well, it's incredible to hear a politician who's agnostic about the money. And it's like being a delivery driver and being agnostic about the petrol in your car, right? Or a, a soldier and being agnostic about how many bullets are in your gun. This is fundamental. And I don't expect everyone to understand it, but I expect our politicians to understand it. And my final point, it's okay to be to think that Scotland shouldn't have its own currency. That's fine. You need to argue that case. But to say that you're agnostic, I think, points to a real deep malaise in a lot of our political discourse if they don't understand the difference between having your own money and using someone else's money. And that's a fundamental reason why we wanted to start the podcast. 
That sounds great. Uh, I mean, I'm not here to defend Alan, but sometimes when politicians say I'm agnostic, it's because they're waiting for somebody uh, higher up the pay grade to tell them what the position is. And it's best to say you're agnostic because if you come down on one side or the other, you then have to scramble about changing your mind once somebody in a higher uh, pay grade has come to a view. And maybe that's, if that is the case, it's not surprising because I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here right now, I'm very unclear about the SNP's position on the currency. I, I know because I interviewed uh, 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 Andrew Wilson uh, many months ago, and he talked about it. There's going to be a 10 year period in which uh, Scotland will use the, the pound sterling. And I think since then that's been trimmed back considerably to five or four years. But as far as I'm aware, and it, 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 it's maybe my ignorance here, I don't know what the position is. I, presume, I assume it's still the same as it was when Andrew Wilson enunciated it with a tweaking about the, the, the time period, perhaps, but nothing else has changed. It will still be the policy to use the pound. Is that the case? Yeah, well, we have to look at the last economic paper, a meaningful economic paper, which was the um, Sustainable Growth Commission. Um, and now when you look at that, it, it looks like it was written in the kind of halcyon days. This is pre-Brexit. It's pre-COVID. Um, um, it, it's talking about issues that we just don't really see as being particularly important. Now, now we look at it, it looked like it was for a different time, but that's still the only significant paper that explains the current Scottish administration's approach to the economy. And I think it's just so out of step now, you know, where, where we are, um, you know, those few years since it's been written, that we can't really start from that perspective. And I think at the moment, the Scottish government is coming up with a new economic policy. And, you know, the nice little document that was done um, a couple of, uh, um, just last month was quite nice. It talks about entrepreneurship and it talks about a well-being economy, but there was nothing meaningful in there. It wasn't talking about what um, the monetary and fiscal stimulus that would be used in an independent Scotland. So I agree with you, John. I think it is at the moment, um, a little bit blurry and we're having to rely on a policy document which is clearly uh, you know demonstrably out of date but it's it's not clear and and last year um, Nicola Sturgeon did say that she still believed in the principles of the um of of that of that document the sustainable growth commission and that was a huge issue for me and you know there's a lot of issues in that document so I agree it isn't particularly clear and I think that comment I can take your point with Alan Smith saying that but I also think that he doesn't understand the difference between being a user and an issuer and I know a lot of the audi audience won't and it is complicated and it is difficult and, and we're hoping through Scotonomics to kind of help people um, on that journey for them to be able to decide okay. do they think it's a good idea or a bad idea. I take it what's implicit in what you've just said is that you have not been consulted by the Scottish government in any way. No, the, the, we've had we've had no communication. Oh, they did retweet uh, our interview with um, with David McWilliams um, and then, and credit it eventually. So they they are aware they are aware of us. Um, That's amazing. So you you, you had a career in neoclassical economics. What, why have you departed from that? Why have you decided that the way economics is taught at university isn't for you uh, you know I, as i said i decided pretty early on and this was this you know this was in the early 90s when i was at university and it just didn't seem right for me but everyone else seemed quite happy with it so i thought there was something wrong with me and then over the last few years i've realized there's a lot of people who have been saying that the way that we currently study uh, and teach economics which is neoclassical economics is wrong and, and my favorite kind of go-to person on this is a chap called Steve Keen who's written this book um, and this was out last year and um, it, it's amazing reading this because Steve Keen tells me a very similar story but it was 1973 I think when he was at university so before I was born he was having these issues with neoclassical economics and it's fascinating and I think if you understand the current economic paradigm at the moment is underpinned by this discipline of neoclassical economics, then I think you can start to see why things have gone wrong. And sometimes when I'm explaining this to people, they don't believe me, you know, and, and, and it's really, you know, one of the most obvious things to say is that in neoclassical economics, they don't account for money in any of their models. So all of the models have everything they're trying to measure, but, but they don't include money. 
Now that just seems crazy to anyone who who, who kind of lives in and, and understands how the economy works. But they just basically say for every debt, there's a credit. So we can just cancel that and we can just take it out. And, and neoclassical economics wants to find the kind of simplest model possible. And that's just incredible, thinking that they don't want to talk about money. So that doesn't talk about how the government injects money or private banks inject money. Most of the theories up until very recently said that money only came from private banks from the deposits that you put in. Now, that's not been the case for decades, but most models will still say that. So it's incredible that they don't include money. And that's really what modern monetary theory is. It's just looking at the economy and saying, hey, money is really important. And here's why. Money means power. Money means, you know, you have to do stuff to get money. And these are the, this is the approach that modern monetary theory looks at the economy and says, let's put money at the heart of it. Money's the tool that makes things work. Um, it's a store of value. And in neoclassical economics, they don't consider it a store of value. They just in, in consider it something that helps you exchange, a method of exchange. So there's huge issues with that. Um, another reason is that it's the only discipline that built itself from its own foundations. So scientific dif disciplines, there's a really good quote here. And um, the physics Nobel laureate Philip Anderson noted that it was possible to rank sci sciences according to the principle that the elementary entries of science um, and the laws of that science are built on another science. So check our science works by going to another science. Economics didn't do that. It said macroeconomics works, and we'll check that by going to microeconomics. So there's no kind of strength of scientific discipline in, in, in that type of economics. And as someone who's doing a science degree now, that's really worrying that her, her whole economic paradigm is built on these clear, these clear issues. And then the third and final one is that this idea of externalities that waste, pollution can all is all external to the economy and also all the inputs are external. In neoclassical economics, it doesn't really account for the energy that comes from the sun and it doesn't account for the waste that goes into the atmosphere. Whereas other types of economics look at that and think this is how economics should have started and this is what's really important. So that's why I've moved away from neoclassical economics and I wish the world would because it's causing huge problems and economists are, are, are you know, are saying that the climate crisis won't really cause that much damage because people will move and there'll be new jobs. You know, they're not taking on board the the science to say that, you know, a three or four degrees increase in the global average temperature will cause a, will cause a climate catastrophe. They're just seeing people up in sticks and moving from Florida to Iowa as a solution to this. So it, it's just, it's just crazy. And, you know, we really need to look at this in a completely different way. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do on the show. Good. It sounds, sounds very uh, enlightening and interesting. I'm reminded of two classic quotes about uh, economics. One is it's described as the dismal science. Uh, and, and two is that we're all victims of long dead economists um, because we live our lives based on their theories and notions without really understanding what those theories and notions are. Yeah, and, and we will all be dead. If we keep listening to their theories, we'll all be dead. <laughs> exactly. But their theories are translated to us by politicians who are grubbing for votes and want to tell us what they think economics is about. And, and of course, the, the one that probably sticks in everyone's mind is when Margaret Thatcher suggested there's absolutely no difference between uh, the way a household economics operates and that of a state. Now, even back then, she must have known that wasn't true. But it made it easy to communicate with people through economics remains a closed book. Uh, because if I say to you, you can only spend what you earn, that sounds plausible. Surely that must apply to countries and states as well. But it doesn't, does it? No, it's 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 um it's one of the 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 the, the most powerful metaphors that have caused the most damage in our modern society is this idea that the country is uh um, is like a household and I remember sitting on a train going down south and I was chatting to an accountant and it was just after um, uh, just after a general election and he said well you know we can't the government can't just spend money and I said you're an accountant you understand how money how money flows and he said yeah you know and it's like a household and I said it's only a household if in your basement you've got a printing press that you're able to rank up and print out and use in times of trouble 
It's nothing like a, a, a household. And this is still a huge issue for us as a society when we view the economy. Now, what modern monetary theory says, and, and it's not what a really important point is, MMT is not a prescription. It's a description of the economy. And it's saying this is how things work. And very basically, you can't pay taxes unless the government has put money into the economy. So that's a description. From that, you're able to say, hey, that'll allow us to do things like a universal job guarantee or a bigger fiscal stimulus packages, these types of things. But it's about prescri- it's about description first. Um, and it describes the economy in a very different way from a household. And it, and it basically says that the government can use money as a tool and it can inject it into the economy up until the point where inflation becomes a big problem. And you can link that problem to the injection of money. Now, there's a huge issue we could go down and we've been really lucky to speak to some brilliant economists about inflation. But going back to that economy, they're just saying, put money into an economy, pay people with it, bring those resources, bring unemployed people into the economy to do stuff, use that money. But when it gets to a point when there's too much money, then pull back on that expenditure through raising taxes and using on you know on, on the wealthiest in society. So it's a very different way of looking at the economy. And as you said, John, it fundamentally gets to the point that it's not a household because a government can use its own money and it can never go bust when you're a issuer of a currency. And I'd like us to definitely get into that. It can go bust if it's a user of a currency. The Scottish government can go bust at the moment because it's not using the Scottish, it's not using Scottish money, it's using money from Westminster. But a country that re, that relies on its own currency can never be insolvent because it can always pay its debts in its own currency. So a huge but, difference between the two. Yeah, I mean, I, I know I know some people watching tonight and listening tonight will be thinking, hold on a second, this is what got Germany into trouble pre-Hitler. They just went around with barrel loads, wheelbarrows full of, Deutschmarks, which were worthless. Uh, and that was caused by printing money. Every time they had to fix the reparations bill for the First World War, they just ran the printing presses. And surely what you're suggesting is exactly the same. And we'll end up in exactly the same predicament as the Weimar Republic. That the Weimar Republic uh, almost 100 years ago. I know. <laughs> I mean, well, a lot. Of- yeah, a, a lot of people remember, people, that. remember uh, the, the notes with million marks. Uh, 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 absolutely, and um, um, and one of the um, um, one one of the hires to the Fed Bank when he got his job in the early two thousands, his neighbour printed out a bit of paper to him and said, "This note bought a house in Germany ten years later. This note, this note bought half a loaf of bread. Yeah. Do your job properly." And that was a that was something he was given and he put on his wall. So it's incredibly important. But the difference was that the money wasn't released to bring resources into the economy, and that's what money is used for now. So we're looking at the economy and we're seeing, for example, there's fifty thousand people who are unemployed. Let's give those fifty thousand people a job. So they come into the economy and they start adding value to the economy. And that means effectively that the value of the money is underpinned by the success of the economy. And that didn't happen in any country that's that's had runaway inflation. They've just been printing money to pay the debts. They've not been using it to advance uh, the is, economy. Is, is, this this another, is this another way of describing something like FDR's New Deal? where he took over the US economy. It was a basket case, really. It was in terrible trouble. And he said, we're just going to build roads all over the country. Anyone who's been to the States and drives on the highways, Route 66, you know, any major uh, thoroughfare in the the US, I-90, whatever, whatever, uh, is driving on roads, a lot of which were built by FDR, just pumping money into the US economy. But of course, he did it on the prescription that you've just outlined, which is that it gave the money to people to build roads in order that they would have money in their pockets, which they then took home and it was spent by the family. Yeah. So it, the money was going circulating in the economy and everyone benefited. You got great roads, people got paid, people were able to raise their standard of living and somehow you managed to keep inflation capped. Yeah, well, we were able to keep inflation cap because inflation wasn't um, dri- driving up prices, and and this is a it's a very very simple. But it, you know, if you've got if you've got two products 
and you've got one if, if you've sorry if you've got one product and you've got two people who want to buy that product then the price goes up to the to the amount of the person that, that that's willing to pay the most and that's inflation and that happens but what can happen and what that kind of fdr approach was that well why don't we build why don't we make two products so that both of those people can buy a product and then the price doesn't go up. And that's what MMT is effectively saying, is use money to bring those resources into play. And you do that up until a point where there's no more resources to, to, to make a third product if someone demands it, so the price then goes up. And that's a very simple explanation of uh, inflation, which is really not real world in, in, in inflation now because the economy has changed so much. But no, it's, that's a really good question, John, because that's what people look at. And they can also say, you know, kind of runaway economies in Argentina and, and yeah. Sri Lanka and Venezuela and all these things. But it's very different because MMT and economists and people like me who've got into it are saying it's not print money forever. It's print money up until a point where you've used all the resources. And a really important point for Scotland is it's a tiny country. So it's so important that we use all of our resources, you know, 100%. When you're a massive country, it's not that important. You can get by on using 90% of your economy and 95% because you're creating so much. But Scotland's tiny. And it needs that money to be able to say, right, let's get everyone working. Let's get all of our factories open. Let's get everything made. As, you know, let, Let's do everything. Let's become an economy that uses all of our resources. And full employment is the most important thing. And I would imagine everyone who's watching has either been unemployed or knows someone who's unemployed. And they know the devastating impact that that can have, not just on a society, but on a personal level. And having the money having your own money to be able to say to someone, you will always have a job. We will always have a job for you because money is no barrier as long as you're unemployed. It's a hugely powerful uh, position to be in. And that doesn't exist and it wouldn't exist if Scotland was using um, the pound and if it was under sterlingisation. It can only happen. And that's what Warren Mosler in that little video says. It can only happen when you can bring those resources into play and you're only able to do that when you've got your own money, when you issue your own money. So these are fundamental issues that we're, we're talking about. You know, as I said, I don't think politicians should be agnostic about. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I've got a lot of respect for Alan, but I think this is one of these areas where you'll probably come back and address that. We're almost at the halfway point, William. I'd like to take a few questions if we may. Jim McIntyre is asking, would the Bradbury Pound concept be a good basis for a Scottish currency? Yeah, and Jim, I think that's the the kind of local the local currency. Um, I think we should have local currencies. I think they're absolutely fantastic, but they're not the equivalent of a currency that's backed by the state. So no, it wouldn't be an alternative or a basis. But I think these things are really important. We've actually got a show on local currencies um, because we you know we feel that they're they're important, but no, very different. Yeah, I think I think what would inhibit a local currency is the fact that Scotland is. Uh, for whatever reason, it's pretty centralised. I mean, for a small country, it, incredibly well, centralised. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> living in Kinross, I mean, I was struck by the fact that you know Kinross is regarded as being too too small to justify its own council, and yet, for centuries previously, that was the case. But it had to be subsumed into Perth. So now there are four councillors in Kinross and 2030 in Perth. And frankly, nobody gives a rat's ass what well, at the time it was up in Kinross, which was a perfectly viable entity. <laughs> yeah. well, that, well, if you extrapolate that to that's where we are in the United Kingdom, isn't yeah. it? We're so, Scotland's so far away, you can't yeah. expect it to be to, to be of concern to people who are hundreds of miles away. And I think yeah. that gets to the heart yeah. of the importance of independence. Charles Smith is asking, are we not experiencing a very serious pencil movement of inflation, rising living costs, etc.?" versus a fixed money supply. Yeah, so the first part of that, um, inflation is definitely happening right now. Inflation of prices. Um, uh, again, we can look at inflation kind of, I think it was um, 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 uh, Ben Bernanke, the former he head of the Fed, who said, you need to look at the cousins. There's price inflation and there's asset inflation. And we always concentrate on price inflation. We never really con concentrate on asset inf inflation. And that's what causes economic crashes because there's these bubbles. It's interesting. He says, when, when prices go up, it's inflation. When assets go up, it's a boom. 
right? But the same thing is happening. So um, in, inflation is happening in, in, in prices, but not for the reasons that a lot of people think. And it's not the 1970s where, where, where you know, unions are sitting in bargaining for high wage rises. Most inflation, especially, and this would be especially the case for Scotland, most inflation is imported. And that's what's happening at the moment with the cost of living crisis is inflation's being imported because we're operating in global markets without any kind of resilience. This didn't have to happen. The UK government for, you know, and, and I'm sure the Scottish government to a lesser extent could have had much more resilience. We could have been talking about renewable energy and, and building that up um, for, for, you know, for two decades. And we haven't done that to the extent we should. But we should have enough resilience. We should have months of uh, um, oil and gas. We don't need to go to the international markets and pay this. So there's a way of running an economy to avoid all of these things. But the inflation points are, are, are really important. But there's no evidence um, that the increase in money supply when you've still got unemployment is causing inflation. Inflation is coming from external rather than what's happening in the country. Yeah, I want to come on to that a second. A real live example of that right now outside the UK. Uh, Mandy Garden is asking, William, do you think there will be a single global currency once the petrodollar collapses? Yeah. Hi, Mandy. Really good, really good question. And this, you know, this is real deep stuff that we could go right back into um, John Maynard Keynes and talk about his idea in the, uh, at the, um, at the um, Bretton Woods Summit in 1944. Uh, God, but no, that's a long dead economist again. Yeah, yeah, that is a long dead economist, a very important one. But no, and and I and I hope that when we can, you know, if we do have time to get into this, and the reasons are really clear because if you've got a global currency, you don't have the ability to do the things that are that you're issuing your own money does. So the dollar operates as a global currency effectively, but it allows these hundred and you know more than a hundred other currencies to operate how their governments and how their society want them to do. So I think one of the worst things that could happen for our society would be any kind of move towards a global currency because money is so important. It's the oil that makes an economy work that it's countries that have got to be able to decide how to use their own currency. If Scotland uses the pound, it would be England that would decide, Westminster Bank of England, who would decide how we used and what, how much money we had in Scotland. If we had our own currency, we'd be able to make those decisions. So fundamentally, I would think that would be a really bad idea for the global economy and the people who live in, in these countries. Well, one more question. Um, Lenny Hughes is asking, do you think Russia, China and the East will start using crypto to avoid the petrodollar? Yeah, I'm, I'm really I'm really interested in cryptocurrencies um, and I see them as assets rather than currencies to an extent. And, you know, we could go into what currencies are, but currencies have to be ex accepted for them to be of value. And cryptocurrencies aren't really accepted yet. Uh, and it's, it's 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 possible they could be. And I think there's a lot of good things about currency, uh, digital currencies, if we call them digital rather than cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of central banks are interested in having their own digital currencies. But no, I don't think that's a way to get around it because, yeah, you can have I think I've got I think I've got about 200 pounds of cryptocurrency somewhere on an app. Right. I can't do anything with it. You know, I don't know what I can buy with it. And that would be the situation that a lot of um, countries are in. Um, they're either trying to exchange it with people um, or they're trying to buy it when no one's selling in it. And, you know, that's, that's a huge issue. So, no, so I don't think that would work. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I've got a fraction of a, <laughs> of a digital currency. I don't know what the hell it is. I mean, it was, I think, like you, I invested £100 or so. And uh, I was astonished at how little I got back in return. <laughs> I had this weird notion, William, that because cryptocurrencies were new and I was, it was new to me, it was perhaps almost as new to other people. I, I had a rude awakening when I discovered that, no, no, I'm sorry, Chun, you've exactly. come very late to the party. Yeah, yeah. We, we're <laughs> at the bottom of the pyramid, John. We're never at the top of it, you know. <laughs> um, well, we should say that if folks watching and listening tonight uh, are interested in uh, and they watch Scotonomics. They can also pick up lots of very useful information online at the Scottish Currency Group. Uh, and I think we're going to post a link somewhere if we haven't already done so, which will enable people to go there and, and cover much more than we're able to do even in an hour tonight. Uh, and so you've got two uh, sources, folks. You've got Scotonomics, which takes, which is on at eight o'clock tonight. 
And also you can go to the Scottish Currency Group website and you'll find those invaluable yeah. in terms of... We're going to talk more about money, you know, and what money does. And, and, yeah. and currency is just a kind of another way of, of looking at it. But yeah, there's a quick guide to the new Scottish currency. Um, and we'll put that link in the show notes so you can see it, which is all about yeah. pensions and, and, and changes in the currency and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Kevin's asking, what about a Scottish digital currency? I mean, yeah, I guess there is one, isn't there? Is there, isn't there a, a, yeah, a, a, yeah. I mean, there's there's thousands of digital currencies. The problem is not launching one; it's it's having it accepted. Um, yeah, sure. and, and, and you know, and, and John, if I could, that's I, I, I kind of wanted to cover what money is, and and crypto is a perfect example to talk about this because you and I right now, I could say to you, um, John, I'm going to loan you a hundred quid. And you could say great, and you and we do an IOU and we sign it. That's legal. That's a legal tender. That can be used. That's a hundred pounds. That's a transfer of money. That's money. You know that is money. But the problem is, if you take that down to the butcher and say, "Hey, William has said that he's going to back this hundred pounds up. Will you take this?" The butcher will tell you to take a run and jump, right? But all all, all government money is is an IOU, and that's what money is. It's nothing really more complicated than an IOU but it's transferable because it behind it is a government and that butcher says well I trust my government to pay the the, the money that's at the hundred pounds on this I know if I go to the bank the government will have put money in the bank and that bank will be able to give me that hundred pounds so I trust that but that's really all money is and I think we can completely overcomplicate it so when we're looking at uh, the, the Scotland issuing its own money or using um let's say sterling at the moment it really comes down to do you trust the government does it have a legal system and does it have a tax system and if it does and if you believe that the economy is working then that money will work and that's the situation we're in you know and i would defy anyone to say that post-independence scotland would suddenly have no legal system an inability to tax its population and wouldn't have a government that people would trust because that happens now and that would that would continue um in the uk is our uk and it would continue for us so that's really all money is it's just something that's backed by the, the state and it, it's used to um it, it's used to store value but also to buy things in a way that crypto it's really difficult for crypto to do that or my iou when you're taking it to the butcher yeah, because at some stage you have to convert crypto back into something else, perhaps. You know? But then again, lots of restaurants accept crypto and digital currency, so maybe that's less of an issue than, than it looks. Mm -hmm. um, I read somewhere, and I want to ask you if, if this is remotely accurate, I read somewhere that the, the word bank emanates from the Italian word banco, which was used by uh, goldsmiths in Florence way back in the Middle Ages. And people who they kept money securely, gold, they had to keep their gold securely and if customers came along and wanted some gold object. Um, but they discovered what was happening was people were bringing their gold and they were saying, because you've got a secure facility, we'd like you to put our gold into your secure facility. And they, the goldsmith would give them a piece of paper, an IOU if you like, and say, here you are, this guarantees you to get your gold back as and when you desire to have it so and that these bits of paper became currency and then people didn't come back for their gold they died they were killed it was the middle ages lots of nasty things happened to people the lifespans were considerably shorter than they are today and therefore a surplus developed so the bankers decided hey i can use this money <laughs> as a deposit and i can print money now because you know is that true or is that someone's fevered imagination? I, I think you're right up until the first bit about um, what the, the, the basically a, a, a bit of paper was an IOU. But, you know, you could go right, right back to ancient Egypt where you would put your grain into the grain mill and, and you would get, you know, uh, someone would scrape something onto a bit of stone and you would be able to take that away so that you came back and you said, I've got a hundred you know, 100x of gold, uh, of grain, and I'd be able to take it out. So this idea of having something that's like a bit of paper that backs up what you've got in the bank has been around for around for thousands of years. And um, in terms of in terms of people deciding to then lend that, then banks started from personal wealth. So maybe, uh, 
maybe it did get to that point where there was there was these stores, but but people were lending money, people were lending their own money or money that they were given to learn lend for an interest. But it's it, it, it's interesting. But one thing I did want to mention was going back to neoclassical economics. Um, neoclassical economics said that money developed as a way to make bartering easier. And this is what I learned at school. And, you know, it'd be interesting if, if you learned this as well, John, but it was just kind of like, you know, the savages would swap two bananas for a, a tree stump, right? And then kind of they decided that let's have money to make this a lot better. But that, that's what neoclassical is. And again, it's taking money out of it. So you never need to include money because it was only there as an exchange value. But interestingly, no one... Who's um, no one who's gone back into history in these societies ever found bartering as a, uh, it never existed right from the earliest kind of conceivable point. People had the type of thing that you're talking about. They had something that stored value, and it was also a method of exchange. Anthropologists, that's who go back and look at societies, it doesn't exist. But neoclassical economists just kind of put their fingers in their ears and they say, "Oh no, it must have. You just haven't found it yet." So. A lot of the stories that we've been told about money and we believe are just not true. And I think that's fascinating when you get into it and you kind of understand that there's a completely different way of doing it. And also it arrived by a very different process than, than what we were told. So maybe your story is partly true um, in, in terms of how banks ended up lending I, I just, money. But now the, banks don't lend. Uh, sorry, go on. I just love the whole idea of... Uh, Goldsmiths, Florentine goldsmiths setting out a bench, a banco, and we use the same word all these hundred yeah. years later. Uh, and, and they backed up the IOU, whatever it was, a piece of paper, with gold. And for centuries, that's mm. what people did. It was backed by gold, it was there. Gold was a, a, a particularly uh, an interesting resource. You could actually, you know, and then we all came off the gold currency. At different stages and things, things, things changed. Um, I want to ask you a question uh, about Sri Lanka. Um, according to the Times, Sri Lanka is in terrible trouble. Mm. Uh, it has its own currency, uh, but it's been engulfed by economic and political turmoil caused by a collapsing currency, ballooning balance of payments problems, and dwindling, dwindling foreign exchange reserves. Uh, and it looks like some of this, at least, I mean, obviously COVID was an issue because if you've got COVID, you don't have tourists, you don't have tourists, you don't have their income, you know, you can understand it to some degree. But this article also lays the blame uh, at the foot of the Federal Reserve because it said the Sri Lankan economy's financial fate also hangs on the actions of the Federal Reserve. And it took action in order to fight off a 40-year-old high in inflation in the U.S., uh, so in other words, they, they, they are doing stuff in the Federal Reserve to protect the US economy. But one of the unfortunate byproducts of that is to cause an enormous problem uh, in Sri Lanka. I mean, people are rioting in the streets. They can't get petrol. They can't get food. The lights are off, all that sort of stuff. I, I mean, I can just imagine what uh, capital, if I can use that term loosely, the unionists would make of this sort of description and perhaps apply it to Scotland and say, look, there's a, there's a country with its own currency and it's a basket case. Not because of any inadequacies in Sri Lanka, but by external forces over which it has no control. What would you say to that? Yeah. Well, there's a lot to unpick there. You know, go, going backwards from what you've said, the first thing is that um, when you're looking at uh, a country, you have to compare it to a, company, a country that's similar. And, and comparing Scotland to Sri Lanka, you know, it is like comparing, you know, um, for for Athletic to Barcelona, right? They both play football, they've both got 11 people, but the idea that there is the same type of comparable in any way is just ridiculous. And, and Sri Lanka is a third world country with huge issues. Scotland is a first world country with huge resources. So it's just not a fair comparison. And I think we have to be in a situation where we say to people, look, if we want to get serious about this, we need to talk about Scotland in relation to, let's say, New Zealand 
or or or, or Denmark or you know um, uh, or, or Portugal or you know so we need to be really talking about uh, economies that are similar to get some kind of meaningful because that's just a, that's just a nonsense you know to say that type of, type of thing but on Sri Lanka you said the issues were caused by a collapse in currency and no the the currency has collapsed because people don't trust the government it does it's not able to collect taxes and it doesn't have a rule of law so that's why the currency is collapsing not because it's got its own currency but people don't have trust in the currency and that's a really important point we've got to look at scotland as a country and saying who wouldn't have trust in the scottish economy how successful it's been how successful it can be how well educated the population are how the resources are how strong the government is and and the legal system and all these things so the economy the currency wouldn't collapse if sri lanka hadn't been used um, if so much wealth hadn't been pulled out of that country by the global north, Sri Lanka would be in a much better position it's in now. And it's not the Sri Lankans fault. It's global capitalism and finance that's looked at the third world as this kind of um, endless pit where we can just extract wealth yeah. from. And that's the huge problem. It's inflation, all these things are, are, are kind of tiny parts of that. It's how since you know since since colonialism and we're into neocolonialism has taken place how we've treated countries in the developing world that's the problem and i bet you that article doesn't even mention that john it does actually and it, i mean in fairness to the author marine can i should say that she goes on to say uh, uh, she said okay the federal reserve is is fighting off this 40 year high in inflation but it not be without cost for low income economies whose reliance on foreign capital and dollar debt servicing places at the mercy of inter places them at the mercy of international markets and U.S. rate set. And, and and just to build on that, what what Sri Lanka have had to do? They've had to borrow in in dollars because no one has believed their currency is strong enough. And Scotland, if it was using its own currency, would never have to borrow in dollars or pounds or euros. But 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 Sri Lanka has had to. Where Scotland, if it had its own money, would borrow in its own money and not foreign money. So when you borrow in a foreign currency, which would happen under sterlingisation, if Scotland was still using sterling, the money that we would be borrowing would be foreign money and we'd possibly face a liquidity crisis if we couldn't pay it off. And that happened. That happened in Europe in 2008. Lots of banks had, had loaned in dollars and all of a sudden, there was no dollars, yeah. and people were saying, we want our money back. And the European banks were saying, well, we can only pay if the Fed gives us the money to do it, because the European I mean, bank doesn't print um, uh, dollars. And that's what's happened in Sri Lanka. Their central bank doesn't print dollars, so they're in huge problems. But in the case of Europe, from- I think in the case of Europe that you mentioned, the Fed did do that. It did exactly. give them dollars. And these are things called swap lines. So they opened it up and they said to, and, you know, you can look at this as being, you know, there's a huge element of racism under this as well as the kind of political and and economic aspect. But the Fed was quite happy to open the swap lines to to the global north and it wasn't so keen to do that to the south. Um, So huge issues that are around global inequality. And, yeah, what happens in America affects everyone who uses the dollar but everyone who trades and you know because of the size of the economy so it definitely has a has an impact and it would have an impact in Scotland and it would have an impact in the United Kingdom because what the fed does matters for for everyone how strong is the british economy right now in your estimation yeah. well i think most people would say that the british com- economy is not resilient and that's a huge issue for any kind of complex system to not have any resilience. Yeah. And, and this was a decision that Thatcher made in the 70s, which was to basically put all of our eggs in the basket of financialization in the city of London. And just and, and just and, and just say to everyone else, you will just get the, you know, you will get the overflowing wine from the city of London and you'll be fine. You might lose your really good jobs that you enjoy, but you'll get some money. And and you know, and that was completely powered by the um, the money from the, the uh, Scotland's oil in the 70s and the 80s. But that's what happened to the British economy. It just specialised. And everyone at the time was saying, that's really dangerous. You've got to have an economy that's really resilient and does different things. So I think the British economy is in a real, really difficult situation. When it loses Scotland, 
I don't think it'll have that much of an impact to the UK. I think the UK will be absolutely fine. I think when Scotland becomes independent, we'll be absolutely fine. And this is a story, this is a narrative that we've been really keen to put across in Scotonomics is to say that the people who say that Scotland will be like Sri Lanka, just ignore them. But also the people who say that England is just going to be an absolute, what do England sell? They don't do anything. They'll miss us. They'll, they'll lose it. England will be fine. It's a massive big economy. It just needs to change but it'll be absolutely fine. So we're just saying that Scotland will work much better for Scots as a smaller independent nation and England will hopefully work better for the majority of people in England. But yeah, it's um, it, it, it's the, the English economy is in real difficulty because of the over capital, the over um, financialization, and also the fact that the economy, most of the wealth is generated by people who rent things and the wealth comes from this kind of idea of rentier capitalism. Yeah. And there's no other economy on the planet that relies and has so much of its wealth tied up in things that don't generate any productivity. So that's a huge problem. And my worry is that Scotland, if it grandfathers everything when we leave the United Kingdom, if it just becomes a little bit like the UK light, and it, then we're going to have all these structural problems as well. And if you look at that Sustainable Growth Commission, that was my summary of it, that this document was saying, we'll be a bit like the UK, but we'll be a little bit better. And that's fundamentally where we can't be. As an economy, we've got to be much more resilient and much more focused towards who gets the benefits, not what the amount is, but much more around who actually benefits from our economy. Good point. Let's take one last question. Uh, and I'm going to give Charles Smith two bites of the cherry tonight. He said, could William clarify the Chancellor and Pundit's statements about quotes reducing the national debt interest, close quote? Yeah, um, th this takes us right back to the um, the household. The, 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 the government isn't a household and that government never has to pay off its debt because it's debt that was issued by the government in sterling. And if you go back to the bank and you say, oh, hey, you've got a debt to me. I borrowed £10 and you need to give me 11 The Bank of England just presses a little keyboard stroke and you've got £11 in your bank account. Now, that's paying off the debt. That's what happens. It's not like the government comes and knocks on your door, John, and says, hey, we need a pound off you to pay this guy's debt. It's not a debt in any meaningful sense, but it's used by people who believe in this idea of a small state to justify the state not getting involved, and I believe not getting involved to do good. But just being able to say, we've got to pay this back. And again, it's that, it's it's really emotive if you say, hey, it's but you can't leave this debt to your grandkids. You know, you've got grandkids, John. You're right. Well, of course I can't. That would be terrible. But it's not a meaningful debt. You're not leaving it to anyone. The government can pay off. And then the final thing on interest is that it's the central bank that sets the interest rate. So the central bank has bonds. And let's say it has a billion pounds worth of bonds. It goes to the market and it says, hey, here's a billion pounds. Borrow it. Give us give us the money for this billion, this billion pound bond. And we'll pay you a billion and 10 million in three years time. If no one takes that at that price, then you just take, then the government says, okay, if no one's buying that, it takes it back. And then it just prints that billion pounds and releases it into the economy. So it's the central bank that controls the interest rate. And that's something that people don't understand. And even a conversation of, of Andrew Wilson speaking to Andrew O'Neill, they didn't understand that. It's the seller that sets the price. Um, when you've got an economy that's open to use fiscal stimulus and and, and and fiscal measures to inject that money into an economy. So a really good question. And I think it gets the heart of how much we've got to explain and expand in terms of our understanding. I, th I think it does in many respects. I agree with you. It's a terrific question. Uh, and it seems to me you've got your work cut out because uh, there seems to be an enormous cast of uh, uh, economic ignoramuses who are out there saying exactly this. And, and they're saying it because they're repeating what the Chancellor's saying. They're saying, here's a guy who's charged with responsibility of the, the Treasury and he's telling us that uh, we're reducing the national debt interest. That must be a good thing. Otherwise, surely he wouldn't say it. Uh, well, that's saying you know, when when the government reduces debt, it means it's taking money out of the economy. And that's not ostensibly a good thing for the economy when the economy is not at full employment. That money should be in the economy, giving people a job and bringing in the economy, you know, planting trees and doing all those types of things. I think that makes abundant common sense. Quick question. Why, in view of the fact that the government can print money as you say, press a button, why did it ever go to the capital markets in the first place? 
So bond, yeah, bonds, you know, and bonds are something. When we were initially, Karen, our co-host on Scotonomics, is really interested in bonds. And every time she asked an economist about bonds, I kind of switched off, you know, and, and then I would come back. And I actually got into bonds and I realised how important they are. I won't bore people with it, but, but bonds, the government doesn't need to do it. It chooses to do it. And it chooses to do it for a whole variety of ways. And we cover that in one of our shows. And I think bond, bonds is a way to give people safe money who've already got money. And it's also a way to de-risk your economy. Because if you say to people, we'll give you X amount without any risk, then you're unlikely to go and speculate or go down to the casino yeah. and waste all your money. So it does have a role, but it doesn't need to be used to finance anything. The government chooses to do that for yeah. other measures. And again, we think that we can only spend when we borrow it. We're effectively borrowing money that we've given people already. So it's just not meaningful in that sense. See, that's very helpful information. And I hope people will go and check out that in more detail because it seems to me we seem... We need to have more intelligent conversations on the doorstep and we need to have a, a wider reach if possible with Scotonomics so that people really begin to understand how important these things are and why it will not do just to repeat the old shibboleths about Margaret Thatcher saying, well, a state is just like a, a household. You have to be you have to be very, very careful about uh, what you're doing and what you're spending and all the rest of it. Well, I, I, think, I think the Chancellor is going to be the last Chancellor of his ilk. I think with the climate crisis and with everything that's happened, we, we can see we have to be much more resilient as a country, countries yeah. individually. And the only way that we can do that is having the state be much more involved. Private business is there to make a profit. It's not there to save the climate. And I think, I hope that he's the last chancellor. And I hope when we're independent that we have people who are much more aware and have much more understanding of how you run an economy when you need the, the economy to be run and supported by the government. And at the moment, I don't really have that confidence in who we've got in charge of the Scottish economy at the moment. Um, and there's a question how many MPs and MSPs are interested in this. I think we've got a huge body of work to really explain to people how the economy is different from the one that they inherited at the start when they came into to, to government. I don't want to depress you, but I was in the same position 10 years ago when it came to the constitution mm. and I'm still fighting. Uh, to get people to understand the basics. Uh, I can't believe it's taken so long. But I think we're getting a few glimmers of understanding emerging, but who knows? Look, I don't want to encroach into your time because Scotonomics is up at eight o'clock. I just want to conclude by saying thank you very much. I've got a few remarks, housekeeping things I need to deal with. Uh, I take it you're going to stick around or do you move? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to head off. But what I'm going to say to anyone who's watching is I know there was lots of questions and I'm sorry we weren't able to get to them. If you want to join us on Scotonomics in a couple mm -hmm. of minutes time, ask me those questions and I, I'll answer them directly. Great. Thanks for that. All right. Right. Thanks, Tony. Tony. Cheers. Thank, thank you again. Appreciate it. Uh, okay, let me just uh, bring us to a conclusion if I may. Big thank you to William. As ever, we have a formidable range of guests lined up for future shows. This is always the place of the big hitters, as you've seen from William tonight. Remember the What's On Guide and Indie Live. You can get all the information there. The TNT show will be back next week with another special guest. Join us to hear from Amanda Berger of Commonweal Live. As always, please look out for my column in the Sunday National this weekend. I described the UK government as the immoral in pursuit of the indefensible. Apologies to Oscar Wilde. You'll find, by the way, the column in the seven days section. Uh, and British democracy at work, you know. Uh, here's a quote. Despite repeated promises, the UK government's announcement today leaves Wales with less say over less money. We'll lose over a billion pounds that could have been used to grow the economy and support our most disadvantaged communities. This is not levelling up, it's levelling down. Who said that? No one else but the Labour First Minister of Wales, Mark Draper. Thanks again and a good night to you all. Join us next Wednesday, please. And thank you for joining us. Stay safe and take care. And now head straight for William on this channel. Scott Economics begins at eight o'clock right now.